Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Nearly two years ago, I completed a study of the prophecy of Isaiah in its entirety. Now, this was done here in Israel in the Hebrew language. And probably the most common response as we were going through this prophecy was this. People had not remembered how full of judgment and difficult things that were found in Isaiah's prophecy. Usually we think of those wonderful prophecies concerning Messiah and the establishment of the kingdom of God and the wonderful things that are going to be the outcome of the work of Messiah, both his first coming and when he comes to establish that kingdom. Well, in this study, we are going to look indeed at a marvelous prophecy. Yes, it is messianic in fact, It's one of the most famous messianic prophecies there is. It is what Yeshua said in his hometown of Nazareth when he was in the synagogue and he was given the scroll of Isaiah and he turned to this place and read it before the people. And what's so amazing is this. Even though this prophecy is full of only good news, wonderful revelation, about what God ultimately is going to bring about for his people. We see that those that were in Nazareth, they did not welcome this good prophecy concerning Messiah because they did not honor or respect Yeshua when he read these things and applied them to himself. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to Isaiah and chapter 61. The book of Isaiah and chapter 61. Now, you're going to recognize from the very first verse this prophecy. It is well known, it is beloved, and it is full of good news. It contains numerous promises that God makes his people. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to receive them in faith and take hold of these things and allow them to influence our thoughts and our behaviors, that we might, and here's the key, that we might participate with God in bringing these things about. And how do we participate? Well, a word that's going to repeat itself many times is the word righteousness. And we are called prophetically, and that means by many prophets, to execute righteousness, to do these things. And when we do, we have the privilege of participating with God in doing those things that reflect the character of God. And not just his character, but his character is related to his will. And therefore, what a privilege it is to participate in those things that manifest to others the character of God, found in the purposes of God, and we can join with him. What a wonderful invitation. And true faith will bring about a desire to do just that, to do kingdom work. Well, let's begin, as I said, Isaiah chapter 61. Let's begin with verse 1. We read, The Spirit of of the Lord God is upon me. And obviously, me here is Messiah. Clearly, this is one of the foremost messianic prophecies. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because, and now we see the reason why the spirit was upon Messiah. 
because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim. And this word for proclaiming, it's the Hebrew word levaser. And levaser is the verb. The noun is besorah. And it means the gospel. So when it says to proclaim good news or glad tidings, it's not just any good news, but this word for good news is always related to redemption, that final redemption. And it began when Messiah came the first time, and it will be completed when he comes the second time in order to establish his kingdom. And there within his kingdom, we will experience the fullness of the promises of God. We will know the blessings of the one true God. What a wonderful time this will be. Therefore, it should not surprise us here that he has been anointed in order to evangelize, to announce this good news to those who, and the word here is anavim, And it means those who, first and foremost, are humble. Now, some translations, they take this same root, and I'm not disagreeing with this, but in the purest sense, it's a word for humble ones. But because it's derived from the same root, it can also be those who are afflicted ones, those who are suffering. But the key here is suffering because of righteousness, because of faithfulness. Those who are rejected and persecuted in this world because of their allegiance and their faithfulness to God. So once more, to evangelize, to proclaim good news to the humble ones. And it says, he has sent me to, and this next word is the word in modern Hebrew for a paramedic someone who arrives on the scene in order to alleviate suffering and pain that deals with perhaps an injury or someone who's very sick. So here we could translate it, that he's also been anointed not just to proclaim this good news of redemption, but also he has been sent to heal, and notice this, the brokenhearted ones those who are full of grief, whose heart is broken because of the injustice and unrighteousness that dominates the world. Now, even though Yeshua used this, as I said, in that synagogue in Nazareth, where he grew up, nevertheless, although it was relevant for his first coming in the fullness of this passage see when he came the first time he promised these things but when he comes the second time he is going to deliver them and this just goes with the two words that that relate to redemption the first word is for the payment the work of redemption and the second word which is more relevant for this chapter has to do with the outcome the results of that payment that was made for redemption So he says, keep reading the second part of verse 1, and to proclaim to the ones in captivity, freedom. And this word dwar for freedom or liberty, it's being set free, but hear this, for a purpose. It's not freedom for the sake of freedom, but it's liberty in order to behave in a specific way. So he is setting the captives free. And this can be understood as captives in prison. We'll come to a word that relates to that in a moment. But also those that are in bondage and first and foremost, bondage to sin. So once more, to proclaim to the ones in captive freedom or liberty and to prisoners. And this next phrase is the term pakak koach, which means redemption. But it's not the normal word for redemption, ones that I related to you a few minutes ago about these two words. It's unique. It speaks about more than likely a redemption that is related to this freedom, this liberty, this change in one's 
condition one's circumstance. And let me just simply say before we go on to the second verse is that this is what Messiah is all about, bringing change. But hear this, bringing about a righteous change, a change that is related to the will of God, the purposes of God. Well, now let's look at at verse 2. Also, it says, verse 2, to proclaim the year of delight or the year of acceptability. Now, this word ratzon has to do with the will of God, those things that he likes, those things that are related to what God sees as proper or acceptable. And what this is, this shanat ratzon, is speaking about the time that's going to take place in the future and what's known as Yemot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah, when things will all be acceptable to God. And those things that were not acceptable to God, he is going to judge and destroy. So look carefully, verse 2, where it says, and to proclaim the year of delight, the year of the will of of the Lord that desire that belongs to him and notice it goes along with notice veyom nakam that is the day of retribution or vengeance that belongs to God and notice with this vengeance that he puts upon the enemies of God and that is the enemies of the people of God there's also going to be comfort comfort all those who are mourning Now, mourning, when we hear that term, what enters into our mind? Mourning relates to death. Mourning is a a form of, of grief, dealing with loss. And here, we're speaking about mourning and understand that because mourning is related to death and death always is connected to sin. Those things that are related to sin, the outcome, the consequences of sin that brings grief and sorrow and sadness. Messiah is going to deal with those things. And he, and here's the key. Remember how this prophecy began, the spirit of the Lord God. And we've said so frequently, the purpose of the spirit of God is to bring about the order of God. And that's why we're talking about the year of the will of God, those things that are acceptable, those things that delight him, those things that are pleasing to him. And then he says, look at verse 3, to put for the ones who are mourning Zion. Now, what is mourning Zion? Those who are grieved because Zion or Zion is a kingdom word world and what it says here i want to get this right zion or zion is a kingdom word when we see that word zion the kingdom should come into our mind and what he's saying is this that there are those who look at the world in its current condition and they see how remote how far away the kingdom principles the kingdom character is and because of that they are full of grief and sadness and sorrow so they're known as the mourners of zion and what is he going to do to such people who are grieved about the corruption and the unrighteousness in the world he is going to give to them glory and it says in exchange for And this next word is ash, meaning to sit in sackcloth and ash. He's also going to give oil and gladness in exchange for the garment of mourning and praise in exchange for a a gloomy spirit, meaning sadness, and to proclaim to them the, that they are the trees of righteousness which have been planted by the Lord in order to glorify him. Now, this is important because it says all of these wonderful things that God is doing, this fulfillment of his promises, in the end, what does it bring about? It brings about a change in the people. 
in order that they can glorify him. So realize something. If God is at work in your life, you are going to be living in a way that brings glory glory and honor to him. So if you're not committed to that, you have not understood that gospel message. Yes, we want the forgiveness of sins. Yes, we want to be reconciled to him. Yes, we want that invitation to be in the kingdom of God. We want to experience those things. But all of these changes are so that we can be placed in a new condition, a redemptive condition, whereby we become a new creation in order to bring honor and glory to him. So these changes, although we benefit, it is for him. Everything is for him. Now look, if you would, to verse 4. It says, they will build the, the ancient, desolate places. Those things that have been destroyed for a long time that are desolate. Those things that were once, those former things, he says, are going to, to rise up. And the cities that have been destroyed and desolate for many generations, they are going to be made anew. So we see a renewal, and the key thought here, in my opinion, is that of restoration. Now, these places were destroyed ultimately by the enemies of God. They did not want Israel to, to thrive, and therefore the enemies came. Oftentimes this was brought about because of the sinfulness of God's covenant people that they were not committed to the purposes of God. But what we're going to see here is a restoration, a rebuilding. And God is going to restore, he is going to, and hear this, reestablish. And by the way, this has already begun. It's going about in our days. Places that were in ruins, covered up by, by soil, hidden, could not be seen for centuries, are now being unearthed and rebuilt. Many of the ancient names of places that were desolate for, for generations have now been built back up. And instead of the enemy living there, we see it has been resettled by the Jewish people, all a fulfillment of prophecy verse 4 and they will build these these ancient places that have been destroyed and have been desolate these former places they will rise up and the cities that have been destroyed and made desolate for many generations they are going to be renewed and look at this verse 5 this change that's happening to Israel <coughs> it is going to have and an impact on not just the Jewish people, but when the Jewish people are restored, it is going to have an impact on others. Why? Well, notice what verse 5 says. Foreigners. This word can mean strangers. Those who at one time had no covenantal relationship with God. So strangers or foreigners, they will stand up. And they will shepherd your flocks. And, and sons of foreigners, it says here, and the implication is they will be your farmers and your vineyard workers. Meaning they're going to come and participate in God's restoration of the land, that reestablishment. There is not just going to be Jewish people, but Jew and Gentile alike that are committed by the same faith through that same gospel and now working together for the same purposes. We see a change with that remnant of the nations. Instead of wanting to destroy, they are going to want to build up. They are going to, to catch the vision that God reveals in this passage, what he wants to be done. Now look at verse 6. And you, this is now speaking of Israel, 
the Jewish people. The sons and the daughters of Yaakov, Jacob. Verse 6. And you are priests of the Lord. Literally it says, and you, priests of the Lord, you shall be called. Servants of our God. And it will be said concerning you that the wealth of the nations you will will eat that is you will partake of and also in their glory you are going to be exchanged meaning this it speaks about a change instead of the nations wanting to destroy they are going to take their resources all those things that relate to their glory their honor and they are going to bring them and want to see Israel built up. The people, not just the land, not just the resources, but the people themselves. Why? What's the message here? It's very simple. When Israel gets right spiritually, when they are strong spiritually, good things are going to happen. What type of things? Kingdom fulfillment. So so this blessing of Israel, is a covenantal obligation we see that going back to god's covenant with abraham those who bless you will be blessed and we're going to see that is going to be alluded to very clearly in this passage of scripture verse 7 in exchange of your your shame what's going to be we have the word mishne which is a word for twofold or a double portion where you were were ashamed there's going to be a double portion and another word which means shame it says where there was shame for and the implication is israel and the jewish people it says they and this is referring to the nations they will shout for joy why because of their portion therefore their land and what does it say here a double portion now this speaks and the language is very clear when you look at it in hebrew what god is saying is this the nations are going to minister to the jewish people what nations those who come to faith and nations we're not talking about nations in its entirety but the word goyim simply means gentiles a portion a remnant from the nations are going to be called out and they are going to want to minister to bless to help to assist to participate in what god's doing this restoration of the land of israel and the jewish people and in the same way that israel remember what the scripture says let's go back to it where it says and you what are going to happen instead of shame you are going to receive a double portion and the shame that and the implication is the shame which you had they are going to shout with joy with their portion why because as israel is blessed so too are the nations therefore their land meaning the land of the nations they're also going to receive a double portion why the measure you measure with is going to be measured back to you and they will inherit and what are they going to inherit the nations they are going to inherit and this is simchat olam now i would translate it and understand it this way the word simchat is a word the gladness of and the word olam well we can think of it as eternal forever but as i've said many times this word is related to the kingdom so they are going to inherit and this with all my heart i believe this is what it's saying they are going to inherit a kingdom gladness why because they participated in the purposes the plan of god and furthermore it says this this kingdom gladness will be to them verse 8 says here for i the lord love justice now i would say this i have a good friend that lives in seattle and he has said to me and i think it's a wonderful statement 
He bases his life on a very simple principle. What God loves, he loves. We can say it another way. What God sees as important, what God is about, what God participates in, what God wants to do, he also wants to do and participate in. And what it's saying here, look at the text, verse 8. For I, the Lord, love. And as I teach frequently, we need to always pay attention to the grammar. Now, primarily in Hebrew, we have, and if you come from a a Christian background, you will use terms such as perfect and imperfect. Now, these two words have nothing to do with when we deal with the New Testament in the Greek language, what is meant by perfect and imperfect. In Hebrew, same terms, but very different meanings and, and application. The perfect and the imperfect relates to an action that is complete or one that is incomplete or will be completed. So we can think of the perfect as the past tense and the imperfect as the future. And primarily in Hebrew, and I'm speaking about biblical Hebrew, we have those two tenses, perfect and imperfect, past and future. What is rare is the present tense and here again if you are trained from a christian background in the hebrew language you will see that as a participle but the point is this whenever that construction is found what i would simply call based from hebrew studies the hebrew present tense whenever that is employed in the scripture it it emphasizes something it, it shines a light of significance on the text when that construction is used. And that's what we have here. For I, the Lord, love justice. And I hate, I hate, and this next word is, is stealing, thievery of what? With burnt offerings. And what this means is this. Someone says, well, I can afford to sin because I have enough to offer up a a burnt offering. And because I can make that offering, I can do that sin. This is heresy. This is displeasing to God. God would never have us with with intent sin simply because we can cover the, the sacrifice that deals with it. This is not the heart of God and is not the heart of a true believer in God. What does it say here? Well, he loves justice and he hates such a rationale. And he says, I will set your, or literally there, I will set their activity in truth. Now, what God is saying here is this, that he is going to make a change. And here he's talking about the Gentiles when it says their action, their activity. He is going to set their behavior, how? He says here, in truth. And what's bringing this about? Why is God working among the nations in this way? Well, it tells us. And a Brit Olam, a kingdom covenant. Now, it means this eternal covenant. He says, I will cut or make for them. So as they as they embrace the things of God. They are going to be prepared by him to enter into a covenantal relationship with him. Now, we're not talking about a a works righteousness, but it simply means that he is going to bring about a change in their life, and the cause of that change is indeed this kingdom covenant, this thing that God's going to bring about. And what we find is this, always, A a covenant comes about because of why? Because we fall under conviction. Because we realize this in our life is unrighteous, displeasing to God, and we want to change. Now, we don't have the power to change in and of ourselves, but we can have that desire through conviction that comes through the revelation of God's word that speaks to, first, our conscience. And then after entering into the covenant, we grow and mature and we are given the Holy Spirit whereby we can understand 
the word of God, the revelation of God, the intent of God much better. Look now to to verse 9. And their heritage. Now, this is a word for seed or offspring, but it has that intent, that, that next generation, their children, in other words, but it's in the singular. Their offspring will be known among the nations. Now, what is this saying? Well, it's simply saying is that they are also going to have an influence upon the nations. Now, they're of the nations, but they can influence the nations. And we see, certainly, this is what believers do. And it's going to become more dramatic in the last days. But once more, their offspring will be known among the nations. And their, and it's another word for offsprings, their offspring in the midst of the peoples. And all shall see them. And they will be known by them, for they are the offspring, that heritage that is blessed by the Lord. So this change, what is being noticed, why they are being seen, is because of the blessing that God has placed upon them. Now, what is the message for us? Well, as Israel is getting right Remember, we talked about this restoration, this reestablishment, God putting things in his order. And what is the outcome of that? The nations are being changed. They are going through a transformation, and they are going to have their own ministry among the nations. They are going to be known and recognized as the heritage of the Lord, as those who have been blessed by, by God looked at verse 10. Now, in verse 10, I would suggest to you that, that Isaiah makes this personal to him. He speaks in regard to this, and how do these things relate to him? Meaning, how does he respond to them? Well, he tells us, look at verse 10. I will rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall, and he uses a different word for, for rejoicing, my soul shall rejoice in my God because, and notice this, this outcome, and this is a kingdom outcome where it says, for he has dressed me in garments of salvation in a cloak of righteousness. Now remember, I said how important righteousness is in relating to the kingdom of God, and we all know the verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And we find that there's great joy. And oftentimes when we look at prophecy, we see that prophecy is really Hebrew poetry. And the chief characteristic of of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. So when we look here, what is parallel to these garments of salvation? Well, we know what it is. It's that cloak of righteousness. So what's parallel? Salvation and righteousness. Why? What's what's the message for us? Very simple. Salvation produces righteousness. Now, when we are saved, we are declared righteous by faith. We have the righteousness of Messiah imputed to us. That's one thing. We have been declared. God sees the righteousness of Messiah upon us. But but that's not all that God does. He works to bring about a change whereby we are not only declared righteous, but we begin to behave, to demonstrate righteousness. So there's the declarative righteousness and also the demonstrated righteousness, and that's what he's talking about here. This cloak of righteousness, he says, I will be wrapped up in as... As a groom, he ministers glory. And as a a bride adores herself with her vessels, and this can mean her jewelry, those things that that are, are beautifying to her. And all of this points to a change. What type of change? A physical, a visible, a discernible change. And that's why we say, 
when God works in our life, there's going to be evidence of that. There is going to be a transformation, one that is visible, one that can be seen by others. And this is what it's speaking about here. Now, one of the reasons why the imagery is a groom and a bride, it's talking about wedding and what's the chief uh, uh, adjective that describes a wedding? Joy or gladness or happiness. And because of this righteousness and this transformation that is happening to God's people, the outcome of that is joy and happiness. Let's look at our last verse, verse 11, where it says, For as the earth will spring forth its sprout, its, its produce, producing, as its garden, what is sown by in it, it's also going to spring forth thusly. And it says, the Lord God, he will spring forth, cause to grow, cause to come forth, to spring out righteousness. And that's why righteousness is such an important aspect of this passage, because righteousness is the number one adjective of the kingdom of God. So the Lord God, he will cause righteousness to spring forth and praise before all the nations there's going to be a wonderful testimony to all and this testimony is rooted in the kingdom and that character of the kingdom what the kingdom is like what the kingdom represents and let me conclude by saying this all of this is the outcome of this anointed one let me say it a different way all of this is the outcome of Messiah. In fact, when it says, he has anointed me, it's the word Mashach. The same word where we get the word Mashiach, Messiah. So all of this is because that he has been set apart for a purpose, and that purpose is a kingdom one. He came the first time when he gave his life, in order to pay the price that we could be redeemed, that is that we can become a kingdom people. And when he comes the second time, it's to establish the kingdom. And what should be done between these two things? We have the privilege as the body of Messiah to work the kingdom work, to do the things that demonstrate the kingdom power, the kingdom reality that's in our life, that's within us now. That's what we're called to do well i'll close with that until next time shalom from israel well we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org again to find out more about us please visit our website loveisrael.org there you will find articles and numerous other lectures by baruch these teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.